from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got three exciting lessons about English, reading, and science. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanese, and we're kicking off today's episode with an awesome English lesson. Miss Deal is going to help us understand the differences among nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Let's check it out. Hi, my name is Cyan Deal. I'm a student at the Nicholas County Career and Technical Center, and I'm in the classroom of careers and education. Today, I'm going to bring a lesson to you about first grade English. Um, Today I have an example about how to use nouns, verbs, and adjectives and how to define them. So let's start with some definitions. The first definition we have is a word that describes a person, place, or thing. That would be a noun. The second definition is a word that describes an action, state, or or occurrence, (laughs) which would be a verb. And the third definition would be a word that describes a noun. So with the chart I have here, and you can do this at home, even on a a piece of paper with pencil or flashcards, anything of like that sort, you just make three columns and you can use any words that you choose. So I have a bunch of random words that I'm going to put together and show you how to teach this lesson. My first word is run. I would say run would be a verb because that is an action. It is something like running. It, you can use it as to describe what a person is doing or um, how fast something can run, like a computer. And the second word is cold. I would say that is an adjective because it describes a word. It was very cold out the past couple days is what you could say. My third word is dog. That would be a noun, because a dog is a thing. And I know a lot of people have pets, and so I'm sure you know someone that has a dog and you can relate to that. My fourth word would be dance. I would say that's a verb, because that is something that you are doing. I'm sure everyone loves to have dance parties or slumber parties where you play music and you jump around. My next word is small. I would say that's an adjective. It'd be like, the small dog ran very fast. It's something that you're describing that you're doing. My next word is eat. I would also say that's an adjective. Everyone likes a good meal. My favorite is pizza. (laughs) My next word is Walmart. That's a place, so I would say that's a noun. Um, I'm sure you've taken your kids to Walmart or you've been to Walmart yourself, and Walmart can be a very fun place. My next word is beautiful, and I would say that's an adjective. You would find the sunset very beautiful, or the lake, something that pops into your mind when you think that something is beautiful. My next word is swim. I would say that's a verb. Have you ever been to the lake on a hot summer day and you go swimming? That's one of my favorite memories and pastimes. My next word is red. I would say that's an adjective. It describes something. It can be the color red. Red is very bright. The red is in like brick color. My next word is park. Now, park would be a noun. It is a place that does, it is place. It's one of your, (laughs) a park is one of my favorite pastimes to go when I want to go hang out with friends or swing or, you know, play a sport. My next word is stand. I would say that's a verb. You can stand in a classroom, you stand in your room, you can stand up and be a proud person. The next one would be nurse. I would say nurse would be a noun. Have you ever went to the doctor and you've seen all the little ladies or men in like different color scrubs with like people or something on them? That would be a nurse. My next one is blue. That kind of goes with the red um, as an adjective. It's describing a color of something. And my next word is New York. 
which that is a place. Have you ever heard of New York City and on like Christmas and New Year's Eve they have the ball drop? Now a great way, a thing that you can do with your kids is put these into sentences. So you can say the small dog ran or run, the small dog ran or run in the cold weather. And then you can have them describe each word and what they think is a noun, verb, or adjective, as same as with the matching. And you could even do New York is very beautiful with the red sunset. And each time you make a new sentence, your kid can either match with the column of the noun, verb, or adjective, or they could give you like the definition of a noun. It is a great activity to enjoy with your kids. Thanks, Miss Deal. Okay, next up, we've got a story titled The Pout Pout Fish. This one's going to be read by Miss Gerald, and I think you're going to like it. Let's check it out. Hi, boys and girls. Today I'm going to be reading The Pout Pout Fish. It's written by Deborah Deason, and the pictures are by Dan Hanna. And you can tell he's not a very happy per fish, is he? So maybe when you hear the story, you'll find out that just because you don't look happy doesn't always mean you won't become happy. The story is The Pout Pout Fish by Deborah Deason, and the pictures are by Dan Hanna. Deep in the water where the fish hang out lives a glum gloomy swimmer with an ever-present pout. You know what a pout is, people that have a sad look on their face. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Along comes a clam with a wide winning grin and a pearl of advice for her pal to take in. Hey, Mr. Fish with your crosstown frown, don't you think it's time to turn it upside down? Says the fish to his friend. Nice thought, Ms. Clam, but I hear what you're saying, but it's just the way I am. Imagine that. I want to be a pout pout fish. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Along comes a jellyfish, he floats through the ocean, his tentacles all trailing in a gentle locomotion. Hey, Mr. Fish, with your daily scaly scowl, I wish you wouldn't greet us with a grimace and a scrowl. Says the fish to his friend, Mr. Jelly, I agree. I'd like to be more friendly, but it isn't up to me. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Did you notice that there's a jar of peanut butter there in the ocean with the jellyfish? Isn't that funny? Along comes a squid, quite a slender squiggly sight. She is squirmy, she is squelchy, she is slightly impolite. Hey, Mr. Fish, you kaleidoscope of mope. How about a smile, a little joy, a little hope? Says the fish to his friend, Mrs. Squid, I would try, but I haven't any choice. Take a look and you'll see why. He does look rather mopey, doesn't he? I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Along comes an octopus with eight great arms, covered on the underside with tiny sucker charms. Hey, Mr. Fish, let me tell it to you straight. Your hulky bulky sulking is an unattractive trait. Says the fish to his friend, Mr. Eight, my chum, with a mouth like mine, I am destined to be glum. I'm a pout pout fish with a pout pout face, so I spread the dreary wearies all over the place. Blub, blub, blub. Now along comes a fish in a silent silver shimmer. The gang has never seen before this bright and brilliant swimmer. She approaches Mr. Fish, but instead of saying, hey, let's turn the page and find out what she's going to do. 
She plants a kiss upon his pout and then she swims away. Wow. Mr. Fish is most astounded. Mr. Fish is just aghast. He is stone-faced like a statue. Then he blinks and speaks at last. My friends, says Mr. Fish, I should have known it all along. I thought that I was pouty, but it turns out I was wrong. I'm a kiss kiss fish with a kiss kiss face for spreading cheery cheeries all over the place. Wow, what a change a kiss has made. So I'll smooch, 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 smooch. See how he smooched all of his friends? And finally, smooch. The end. Thanks, Miss Gerald. All right, for our final segment today, Miss Sinisi is going to share a fun botany lesson. She's going to teach us about different types of leaves. Let's check it out. Today's lesson is on types of leaves in plants and trees. We're going to look broadly at all leaves. When we're looking at all leaves, they're classified into two major types, two main types. Those types are based on the arrangement of the leaf lamina. And the lamina is the broad, thin, flattened surface of the leaf. So as we're looking at this leaf, the lamina is the outside, this part of the leaf. And it is where photosynthesis and transpiration occur in plants. If you notice, this is a green leaf, so it's able to photosynthesize. The green pigment is chlorophyll that gives us that helps us to photosynthesize. Transpiration is the reverse process of photosynthesis and it helps the plant to be able to give us the oxygen that we need to breathe. So let's look at types of leaves and I sort of drew a schematic here so we can see the types of leaves. The first type are just plain simple leaves. That's a single undivided leaf. Here, just like this leaf, a single undivided leaf on this branch with the little stem, and we're gonna talk about the parts of the leaf here in a few minutes. Then, of course, if we have simple, we also have compound. And compound, our leaf, the leaf is divided into multiple leaflets that are attached at the stem. So if you look at this leaf, this would be a compound leaf. We have one, two, three leaflets all attached at the stem. But then we have to say there are two different types of compound leaves. The first type we look at are called pinnately compound. They're feather-like arrangement of leaflets from, a mid, from the mid vein. So here we have a bunch of leaflets that are attached to a mid vein and then attached to the tree. Palmately compound, on the other hand, the leaflets radiate outward from a single point. So they sort of look like the palm of your hand. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute when we look at leaf structure. So those are the two broad types of leaves. So take a closer look at simple leaves. That single leaf with the undivided leaflets that are directly attached to the stem, which is the one that we looked at, a simple leaf, um, it's always attached to a, twi a twig by the stem or the petiole. This part here that attaches it to the stem is called the petiole. And the stalk that joins the leaf, that's the stalk that joins the leaf to the stem. So we have some examples, maple trees, oak trees, banana trees, mango trees. Those all have simple leaves. Compound leaves, we have that leaf that is composed of multiple leaflets that are attached at the mid vein and they're having its own stalk. So we have rose, clover, if you've ever seen poison ivy when you're out walking around, or chestnut, horse chestnuts, those are all compound types of leaves. Let's look at the palmately compound with those leaflets that radiate outward. Those are similar to the fingers on your palm. That's why it's called palmately. And it's based on the number of leaflets um, and though we can categorize each type of those further into the how many leaflets it has. So if it has one leaflet, it is uni, which means one, folate, which means tree. We talk about foliage, which are all the leaves on the trees. Two, bifolate. Three, trifolate. Four, quadrifolate. And if it has any more than four, five or more, it's multifolate. 
Then if we look at pinnately compound leaves, which is our another type of compound leaf, the leaflets are arranged symmetrically along the center of the leaf where each leaflet appears to be attached or pinned. They looked pinned to that mid vein or the mid rib that makes the leaf look like a feather. So we get palmately from being shaped like your palm and pinnately from the leaves looking pinned, like you would close pin something on the lawn. The leaflets look pinned to the mid vein. Depending on the number of times the leaflet is attached to the midrib, pinnately compound leaves are also categorized. The same sort of, of idea, uni, one, pinnate, we have a single compound leaf attached to the midrib. If we have bipinnate, we have two, tripinnate, we have three leaves that are attached. Sort of like our example here, we see these three leaves that are attached to our midvein. So we have some common leaf shapes, and I wanted to show you a few um, ideas. We'll look at some samples here of leaf shapes. Oval <coughs> leaf shape is kind of like that. If you see that that is an oval leaf shape. Then we have lanceolate, which is sort of skinnier, obovate, elliptical. This one is called spatulate because it looks like a spatula. Then we have one like this that's called chordate. We have um, oblocordate, and then we have obdocordate. So this one is the, this one together that's oblonged, and this one looks sort of like a heart-shaped. We have one that's just plain oblong, linear, which is just a straight line. Then we have peltate, and then we have ones that are called um, reniform that sort of all radiate out. And then we have one that's called um, hastate. So they're just different types, different shapes of leaves have different names. I just wanted to give you a quick example of that so that you understand that um, there is a, a large variety of leaves and shapes. So now let's look at leaf anatomy. We will look at this leaf because it looks sort of like that one um, in our leaf anatomy. Um, here we have the apex. See how this comes to a tip up here? That's the apex. Apex always means the tip, like the apex of a mountain. Along the side here is the margin. If I flip it over, it's easier to see the midrib. This one line that goes straight down the center is the midrib. And then these that radiate off of there are called veins, just like in your body. Those are veins. Down here is the base of our leaf. We've talked about the petiole, which is this part that would connect that leaf to the stem. And then sometimes we have these little tiny leaf-like structures that are called um, stipules, and they're here at the bottom of where the petiole joins to the stem. This whole thing is a blade. So instead of calling this a leaf, we could say this is a blade. Like a blade of grass, this is the blade. This whole part without the petiole is the blade. Most leaves are broad and flat and typically green when they're photosynthesizing. This one has already lost its chlorophyll because it has fallen from the tree recently. Um, the blade is the broad portion of the leaf. The apex is the tip. The margin is the, is the leaf edge, and it can be smooth, jagged, as in this leaf. If we look at the edge of this one, can you see the difference? How this one's kind of lobed, this one's very jagged along the edge, but that's still the margin of that leaf. Um, veins are vascular tissue bundles, those veins, and they help um, to support the leaf and they transport nutrients out to the leaf like your veins do in your body. Um, and then the midrib is just the central vein. Mid means in the middle, so it goes down the middle. And the base is the area of the leaf that connects the blade to the petiole. Right down here would be the base of this leaf. And then we can look here at the petiole, which we've already looked at that thin stalk that attaches the leaf to the stem, this part, and we don't have any stipules, those little leaf-like structures at the leaf base. Leaf shape, the shape this is, the margin, the outsides, and the venation, the vein formation, are the features we used in plant identification. So if we go out into the woods and we pick up a leaf, we can be able to tell what tree to genus and species according to those things, those features. I wanted to break this down a little bit for you and talk about leaf tissues. So if we were looking at this leaf, and let's look better here at the green one, and if we would take a cross section, you know what that means? We would take and cut this straight down and look into it. This would be the outside here, and this is actually showing you the back of this leaf, and then the other, the other parts. So on this 
outer part of this leaf, we have what are called stoma, and that's an opening. And those openings are, are, have two cells on either side called guard cells. And the opening and closing of that stoma help to um, uh, regulate the carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. This is the upper epidermis. So we'll look at that like you're on your skin. Epi means on top of. So and, and dermis means skin. So that's the upper part of the leaf. It has a waxy, this one does kind of have a waxy cuticle, like a waxy feel. Then if we go on down, we get into the photosynthetic cells, the ones that can photosynthesize here. This is the spongy mesophyll. Here's a vein, the lower epidermis, just like the upper epidermis. Here would be a cross section of our guard cells, which, are, which um, open into our stomata and the air space here in the leaf. So leaf tissues are composed of layers of plant cells. And different plant cells have types from the three main tissues. We have the epi upper epidermis, the lower epidermis, and the one in the middle, meso means middle, the mesophyll layer. If we break that down, the epidermis is the outer layer, and that's going to secrete that waxy coating that you feel. It's called a cuticle, like on your fingernails. Uh, that helps the plant to retain water. So when it absorbs that water, it doesn't all leave the plant. It can help it to retain water because of that cuticle. And then those guard cells I told you regulate gas exchange between the plant and the environment, and they control the size of that stoma. So at night, they close here in regular plants, and then in the day, they open up up and allow more of that gas exchange to occur. Mesophyll is the middle, and within the middle we have two parts, the palisade mesophyll, and those are those big column-like cells. Most of the chlorophyll in the leaf is found here, therefore that's where most of the photosynthesis occurs. We also have the spongy mesophyll, and it's below the palisade layer, and it just has irregular shaped cell cells. Vascular tissue is also found here, the veins. This is where the veins are in the mesophyll, so we can carry those nutrients. The vascular tissue, the leaf veins are composed of, um, have different structures. They are tube-shaped. They look like a long, like a, like a, in a paper towel roll. And then they have those, they're called xylem and phloem. And those provide pathways for nutrients and water to flow throughout the leaf and plant. These two, xylem and phloem, carry those nutrients. I wanted to give you like a little bit of look at like adaptations of leaves. Some leaves are specialized. They have specialized functions. If you go into a restaurant, one person's a waitress, one person's a cook, one person, you know, seats people, the host or hostess. So leaves are, can become specialized. They perform functions that are different than just plain photosynthesis. We have an example of that would be carnivorous plants. Carni means meat, right? And vor, we're looking at eat. So the carnivorous plants have specialized leaves that lure in and trap insects because they don't just want to photosynthesize. These plants want insects for nutrients. So they look um, ornate or they look bright colors and they look pretty and they want to lure in these insects because that wants to supplement their diet. Not only do they photosynthesize, but they can supplement their diet from nutrients they get from those little digested animals. And a lot of people have seen a Venus flytrap or have heard of a Venus flytrap, lures the fly in and once it gets them, enzymes that are produced by that plant, they release and they digest that prey so that that plant can also use. So it's sort of um, a specialization in a plant. Another example of leaves um, that are specialized are called pitcher plants, like a pitcher that you would put tea in or lemonade, and they're shaped like that, the leaves are, and they're brightly colored because the insects like bright colors. So it gets the insect in, and then the inside walls of those leaves have like waxy scales on them, and that makes them super slippery, and the flies fly or whatever insect it is goes to the bottom and get trapped there. And once they're trapped there, then they are digested by those enzymes. So that's just sort of a, an idea of specialized. We also have leaf imposters, things that look like leaves. An imposter is somebody who impersonates something else. So some animals that are out there mimic leaves in order to avoid detection. So certain um, bugs or certain insects look like leaves. That way their prey don't notice them. They just think it's a leaf and go on by. Um, they camouflage as leaves as a defense mechanism against predators. 
Other animals might appear as leaves to capture prey, which would be the opposite. They look like a leaf and a little animal lands on it and then they get their prey. Um, an example of that are um, Amazonian horn frogs. They look like leaves to capture prey. So we hope that you enjoyed our lesson on leaves and you could get out and find some leaves and learn to identify them and look around at all the beauty that's around you. Thanks, Ms. Sinisi. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We wanna thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons. And we wanna thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.